Finally getting season uh, season two episode two underway. Yeah, season two episode two. Um, today we have Jay Mahaffey with us. I'm really excited to bring Jay on for Happy Hour with Hannah. We Josh and I have been talking about bringing Jay on for about a year now. He might not know that, but um, you know we're really excited to finally be able to make it happen. And I think Jay, you're excited to be here all the way uh, in Scott, Mississippi. So yep. we're uh, two different parts of the country right now, but um, we're really excited to talk about PGR management and cotton and specifically Delta Pi cotton. Um, and uh, first I'll start off with a, a quick introduction introduction of Jay and then we can kind of jump right into it if that sounds good to, to you, Josh. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and happy St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, happy, happy St. Patrick's Day everybody. I tell you, this, this, uh, this live video has our here, we, we split this thing up. Cotton's my passion. I love uh, getting to plan this thing. And Jay, you are the perfect person to get on here to discuss the things we want to talk about with uh, Cotton in the Carolinas. So I really look forward to having this conversation with you. I know a bunch of my cotton growers I've been talking to are uh, going to be on here today. I saw Benji Howell was up there. My brother Kip's up there. Jonathan Evans. My husband's up your there. Your husband. <laughs> he doesn't Cotton. go Cotton. It's still St. Patrick's Day. That's right. Yeah, we're celebrating him today. That's right. But and we're, we're just really excited to get this thing uh, going. Uh, Cotton's my passion. I know it is yours too, Jay. So give us a little introduction and yeah. uh, we'll, we'll roll right on. Yeah. So um, so Jay was born and raised in Chase, Louisiana. Um, and then he went to school in Louisiana as well, University of Louisiana at Monroe. Um, and he studied uh, uh, agricultural aviation, which when I read that this morning or yesterday or Monday, I don't remember which day. Um, I thought it was really interesting. I had never heard of the degree of agricultural aviation. So I want to learn more about that. Uh, we'll have to save that for another time. But um, And then Jay, Jay actually came to North Carolina that's, for his master's degree. That's how I knew I liked Jay so much, <laughs> is when I found out he'd come to NC State. NC State, that's, that's right. right. Um, and and uh, his degree there was entomology and statistics. Wow. And I don't know if that's one degree or two degrees, but either way, extremely impressive. Yeah. Um, I was blown away by that. I took a couple of entomology classes in, in college and um, found a lot of interest in that. So I was really interested to hear that those were your those were your master's degrees, Jay. Um, so then jo he joined um, the he actually joined Delta and Pineland, which is right. right. Delta and Pineland, as an entomologist in the technical service. Um, division of the company okay, yeah. and um, he was working in the development and supporting new products new technologies um, bringing forward a lot of different uh, new stuff mm -hmm. for the organization as well as for the cotton industry in general um, and then he started working with Roundup Ready Boulevard 2 like I mentioned the new technologies mm -hmm. and Roundup Ready Flex um, and then for the past six years he has been the manager of the Scott Learning Center in Scott Mississippi and um, managing where they test the latest advanced agronomic practices for cotton, um, as well as for cotton, or for corn and soybeans, but specifically with cotton. So, um, Jay, if I missed anything, jo Josh, if I missed anything, feel free to add on. If not, we'll jump into a couple questions. Go, go Wolfpack. That's, That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, I have a, a special place in my heart for North Carolina and always will. Uh, so Jay, you, you've been in the cotton industry long enough to see a lot, if not all, of the technologies launched um, over the past night since, you know, 24 years, since 1996 yeah. with um, Volgard, uh, or Roundup Ready, right, excuse yeah. me, and um, so you've, you've definitely seen a, a lot be introduced to the cotton industry. What would you say had the biggest impact on the cotton industry and why? Well, I, I personally think the biggest impact on the cotton industry is the culmination of all of that. When you think about what has happened in the last 30 or so years in cotton, we have finished the eradication of boll weevil across the U.S. cotton belt. We have introduced new technology that allowed us to get control of things like tobacco budworm and cotton boll worm for the most part. What that has a the biggest change that's associated with all of that, you have to add it all together to really get to it, and it's the change in varieties. And that, that comes with a change in management that is necessary to really optimize the performance of those products 
and it's it's been the greatest success, but it's also one, been one of the bigger challenges is to understand how the new varieties behave, and what we need to do with. Them. Absolutely, yeah, Josh. I mean, we, you've yeah. seen you've seen more than I have come in and out of, as far as varieties go, but um, I think just in the short time that I've been here, it's amazing to see how much um, the management has changed because of varieties. So yeah. back backing back to even you know 1996, what we were talking about a few minutes ago, um, I can't imagine what, what what have you guys seen that might be interesting to someone so, newer in the industry. So Jay, I, I think back when my cotton career started, you know, when we first came into the industry and started growing cotton on my family's farm, we were looking at, uh, at, at varieties like triple nickel and, and triple four. And you know, when you compare them to what we're doing today, I know triple nickel would grow. But you know, when you compare them to what we're doing today, I think that's a really good segue into uh, the management piece of it and how the old mentality was, I, sh I don't want to shut this crop down with too much PGR. The new mentality is, gosh, I, got, I got to be more timely with PGR applications and, and we really want to get into talking about your work that you've done down at Scott, uh, Scott Learning Center and, and where that brings us with these new Delta Pine varieties. We've got a, a heck of a lineup. I've been uh, talking to guys about transitioning away from a 1646 acre over the next couple of years into a uh, class of 20, 2012, 2020, 2038, 2055. All four have a phenomenal fit in our area. But you know, when we think way back to those early varieties and now where we're at, it's a whole different ball game uh, when, we, when we think about managing it. So look, jump into to some of the things that you have seen at the Scott Learning Center that that really uh, have changed over the years and you think are relevant to these new varieties? Well, when, when you think about the change that has occurred, I, I'd even go back a, per, a generation further than that. You look at varieties that we grew when, when earliness was of the ultimate importance. It was Delta Pine 20 and Delta Pine 50, and you know, there were some competitors that, that, fitted, that fit that sort of a, a mindset. Mm -hmm. That's not so much the, the emphasis today our emphasis today is on improving yield and maintaining fiber quality. Well, you, you move into the products like 555 and 444, you mentioned those two. Those are two interesting contrasts that are really the intermediate steps of number one, the transition, but it's also indicative of the different management regimes we have to use today in managing cotton. 555 taught us a lot of lessons about how we need to be more aggressive in managing cotton. And there's a couple of ways to be more aggressive. You can be more aggressive in rate to a point, and you can be more aggressive in timing almost always. And, and there's an acknowledgement of the difference in the varieties that, that makes you sort of have to lean toward those kinds of decisions. 444 was a fairly determinate product, although we were coming out of that very determinate era of cotton breeding at that time. You know, the, the products like Sure Grow 125 and Delta Pound 50 and 20 and those kind of things, even 1218, those were very determinate products that were that were meant for us to be able to get out of the field quickly. Well, today what we've learned is that time and the accumulation of heat units helps us to improve yield as we have those those heat units available and can use those to grow the crop. The, the cost that that comes with, and I don't mean cost in a sort of a negative way, but the, the influence that it has on our management system is we have to be a little more aggressive in our management. Now, that varietal change has been very important, and it's been important from a couple of different directions that a lot of times people don't associate with all of this decision-making process. Part of it is that as we move toward less and less determinate sort of products, and I mean across the range of things that are sold today. I'm not just talking about 1646 or 2055. I'm talking from the range of 2012 all the way out to 2055 or the latest thing that we'll sell. All of those products are less determinate than the things we have historically grown. Now, they all have to be placed and should be on different environments. The influences that that, 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 that has had on our cotton production is it has let us move cotton onto acres that were really a little bit too tough you know they were stressful environments they were difficult to farm if they could grow anything it was just a very difficult sort of an environment well those less determinate products allow us to, to use that acre and grow cotton on the the other thing that they have done is allowed us to increase yield pretty significantly across the cotton belt 
and, and if you look at the state results for the long term, every state that I know of, the average yield over the last 15 or 20 years is up significantly. And the, yes. the influence that that has on this conversation today is, is know the variety that you use and understand that they're not what they were 20 or 30 years ago. Right. Because right. people had a negative experience with growth regulators when growth regulators were new. And I was a little kid when all that happened. That's not today. You know, the management <laughs> we didn't use on these varieties is different. That's definitely um, a really good point. And I think it's, it's good for um, us to think back about 20 and 30 years. I mean, obviously, I, I wasn't here for that. But at the same time, it's good for me to learn about because I think you're right when you say there is a specific placement um, for each individual variety, and especially back 20 and 30 years ago when we didn't have the technology that we have nowadays to specifically create varieties for those pieces of tough land or really good land or whatever it may be, especially on tough land. You said, you know, we didn't typically get to grow cotton on tough land, and now we've been able to take that, and yes, it might it would require a little bit more management, but at the same time, you, you know, you mentioned the yield advantage even in the past 10, 15 years, we were talking about the Carolinas and before before the show we went live today and you know you were you were telling us about the yield advantage is, is so significantly higher now than it has been in the past. Yeah. So it definitely is. You know, it's 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 a it's a, sort of a fact of biology and meteorology and a bunch of other sciences that go together is as we're able to use a longer and longer season and we can accumulate more and more heat units quicker or, or through the season. We can, generally speaking, make more sugar, support more fruit, set more fruit, do all those things that we need to do to increase and improve yields over time. The the cost that that comes with is all this management, and, it, and it's not a big, you know, it's it's not a big deal so much if we acknowledge it going into the decision making process. And that's really, I hope, what we're we're going to talk about today a little bit. Yes, a a absolutely, absolutely. So. Um, I guess that, that leads right in. I think you, you know, let's just keep right on talking about that and, and elaborate on what some of these things that you're seeing over the years that have changed around management and, and what are some things that are really relative to our guys. I know, you know we're on Facebook, this thing broadcasts all over the world, but we're, we're concentrated on the Carolinas. When we look at South Carolina, North Carolina, and Southern Virginia, what are some things that you have found out over the years uh, in your studies that would translate to a more consistent, higher yielding, better fiber quality, better overall cotton crop for our growers up uh, up here in the Carolinas. Well, that's actually my greatest delight is to try to interpret all this data in multiple environments that are, you know, I, I hear a lot of people say when they come to Scott and they see our data, yeah, that's on the bank of Deer Creek. Well, if you don't know much about Deer Creek in Scott, Mississippi, it's a deep, silty sand. It's probably some of the most productive soil there is. There's not much of it on the earth. I understand that, but I also benefit from the, from my experience, life's experiences. I guess I grew up on a thinner soil in northeast Louisiana, in the presence of the boll weevil, and moved to North Carolina, uh, and and went to school. And I was able to work in Edgecombe and Martin counties and a bunch of those places like that, Washington County, past the tank for that matter. And and I learned that the world is a much bigger place. It's a much more diverse place. And I think it's fun to try to interpret this data into the utility for those sorts of environments. It's actually kind of my greatest delight. And when I when I talk about that, it's from that perspective. It's not telling you what we learned in Mississippi, like you're farming in Mississippi. I understand it's a different place. The point of it is when you think about these varieties and how they behave and how they grow, Understand that they're not what number one, not what you grew 20 or 30 years ago. And I'm not being critical of something somebody has already done. I realize people stay in business and they get in business because they know how to manage their farms. What we're talking about is a refinement in management. And when you get down to that point, the question is, what do I do? Well, number one, choose the varieties that are adapted in your environment. If you're on a very growthy soil, a very strong fertility case, and high organic matter soils that grow always grow too much stalk, that may be where you move to some of the mid maturity type things. Or you don't have to be, uh, or you, you need to be uh, concerned about the management 
implications of population and PGR and so forth. If you're on those thinner soils over in the Piedmont and places like that, that's, you know, 1646 sort of country where you got some stresses involved. That, that, that's a big piece of the decision. And, and I'm talking about individual varieties as examples. There's lots of other choices. The other question becomes, and this is the radical change in management that is somewhat, I guess, disturbing to some folks. The experience with pigs early in its life was not good. You know, it, or I say pigs, I mean mefquat chloride, generally speaking. Sure. When you talk about what it did, it was, it, in a lot of cases, there was a little bit too much applied. It reduced yields because it restricted vegetative growth in some of those determinant plants. All those sorts of things play in this, and a lot of people remember that. And the message I would give you today is that that's not the case anymore. You can still overdo it if you tried real hard. But the varieties you're growing today are much more productive. They're much growthier, both above ground and below ground. They really like to get up and go. And what that means is they make a lot of sugar and they support a lot of fruit. The, the cost that comes with that is having to intervene when you need to. Now, the next question is, what do I do when I need to intervene? And that really is the question. Because that's the, that's the decision a person that buys this seed has to make. And the people that sell this seed have to make it times. So when you plant a variety on one of these soils where you, you know, historically you think you can manage it, it's okay. Realize if it rains, if you lose fruit, if your fruit retention goes down for any reason, if it threatens to try to grow away from you, it's going to grow away from you. And that has to be dealt with in your management scheme that you design for each individual field. How do you deal with it? And and I, you have to do this on, on a field-by-field -field basis. The, the question Absolutely. becomes, what do I do? Well, maybe you go out and apply, maybe not maybe, <laughs> almost certainly, go out and apply a reduced rate of a growth regulator when the cotton's eight or nine or ten nodes. And that way, mm -hmm. when you come back, in you know two weeks or two and a half weeks and you think man this cotton's growing away it will respond better to the next application that you make right. because growth regulator is active at a dry weight concentration what that means is the smaller the bigger plants you have the lower response you get the more it takes to get a response and secondarily if i put some on there early it's generally in there late so we can go out and prime the plants, if that's the right word, you know, sort of precondition the plants a little bit to be a little better control when we decide we're going to come back and make those second, second or third applications. And that's pretty. Important. I think that's a really good point about the, um, you know, individual fields because those individual fields are totally different in North Carolina, even within half a mile of each other. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. It can be different. Um, and, and same with the variety piece on that, you know, um, you might have 1840 in one field and 1916 in another. Those are totally two totally different growing That's animals. Right. And 2055 versus 2038 or 1646, same, same, same thing. So um, really appreciate the, the feedback on the individual field piece of that. Yeah, I, I couldn't think of two different fields that had 1840 and 1916 planted outside by side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But exactly. that is the world. You know, the world's not yeah. a uniform set of fields. And what that means, and I'm preaching the choir a little bit, but what that means is you got to play some varieties very specifically to what they are, are, are and are not. And your management, according to the background of that variety, has to be very specific to that field. That's what makes this fun. I know it's actually yeah. times, but it, that's. I'm sure it is. Yeah, no, it is. I I, I learned. I, I told uh, Keely Dolston he comes out here every year. We walk around looking at these NPE plots, and I learned more from watching somebody like Keelan or even yourself. You know, we were walking around. There's more to, to know about a cotton than plant than I could probably ever learn, and this that's what makes it so interesting to me because every year is different, every application is different, the PGR is different, mm -hmm. the varieties are different. Um, it's just the this it, it, it stays very very interesting. Well, James, so, go ahead. So I was I was gonna say something that Zach and I Zach Webb and I uh, are talking to a lot of growers about specifically with a plant like 1646 
uh, this have 2038, 2055, whatever you want to talk about. But, you know, we've had a lot of success in the Carolinas with varieties like that. And what you just said reiterates exactly what we've been telling guys. You know, if, if you get out there early on and you'll give it that shot, maybe it's dry, and a lot of guys, when it gets dry, they're hesitant to go out there and put a shot of PGR on at all. And we're telling them, we say, look, if you go out there and you put four ounces or five ounces, whatever it may be, just put something in that plant to get it to start reacting. If, if that plant stops growing, it wasn't because of PGR. It was because you didn't get any rain. The spigot turned off and, you know, it was going, the, the heat and the drought got it, not the, the, that little shot of PGR. That little shot of PGR sets you up for success, especially in those more aggressive plants uh, in the long run. Especially if it does rain. That's exactly right. And, and so, what I tell which, people is exactly what you just said. If it didn't grow, it wasn't going to grow anyway. You didn't stop it with four ounces of PGR. That's, what you did right. was, was manage the risk associated with get, it getting away from you in three weeks. And that's that's exactly really right. what that's right. all about. But I would add a couple of other points to that whole conversation. We, we do a lot of sort of novel work at Sky, and I've recently taken the effort to analyze about 10 years worth of our data. And if you look at that data, it says that if I have a, a variety that is that is more responsive to PGR, now, mm -hmm. take that for what it's worth, that's 15, 18, 19, 16, you know, that sort of stuff. It cost me somewhere on the order of about, you know, uh, 17, 18 pounds, an extra inch of height that I develop in the field. If I take a variety like 2055 or 1646, and I let it get out of control, that extra inch of plant height cost me about 23, 24 pounds an acre. That, that is amazing. That that, is, I had never heard that said like well, that. Well, yeah. that, that's amazing. The reason you've never heard that is that, uh, that's recent news. <laughs> we just it. put that publication out over the wintertime, and it has been very, uh, I'd say it's been talked about a lot around the cotton business, and there will be a more enlightened view of it coming shortly. That, yeah. that publication is available to the public for anybody who wants to see it on uh, whatever the, the name of the website. Don't put detail there. I'll, I'll get that to you and we'll share on the Facebook page yeah. so, we, so we can share it with our, yeah. uh, with our folks. But, yeah, absolutely. We'll tag um, you in it and we'll share yeah. it to the Facebook That's page so that we can oh, continue absolutely. this I have a link absolutely. that will post the PDF straight to the page for anybody who wants to read it. And all it is is a word of warning. If you're going to grow yeah, those big, yeah. tall, aggressive growing things because you need stress tolerance and it rains, you better put yourself in the position of being able to deal with the growth characteristics of that yeah. plant later on. And the way you do that is, you know, think about the agronomics, fertility, population, and all that. But really, there are a lot of times where it's warranted to go out and put out a rate of PGR that may not even give you growth control, but it primes the plant to do something different in a, in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Right. So I think you brought up a, well, well I, I think, you know, finding parts of the job that are your favorite um, is important to me. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I'm having those rough days or, you know, even, you know, the good days sometimes. It's like, right. all right, I have, you know, I have a folder in my email inbox that says this is for the bad days, but I click on it and scroll yeah. through it. So I think that's important to say, you know, you enjoy um, the, the, the research part of it. And that kind of leads me into my next um, question. Um, so, you know, you, you have done a lot between PGR trials, population trials, um, uh, with specific varieties, foliar fungicides. Um, so you've seen a lot across the cotton board. Um, can you tell us of all you've seen, what is your favorite or what do you think is the most valuable uh, trial work that you, you've done? Well, that, somebody like me, that's almost unfair, but I'll answer. <laughs> I have a favorite and I have a most impact. Now, and there, there are actually two different things that are interrelated. The, the most impactful thing that I have worked on personally, aside from all these biotech traits that I've worked on over the years, I know, I understand the impact they have. I love insects and I'd rather kill bugs and, you know, play that game than anybody. And I feel like a little bit of a traitor saying this. But I am absolutely yeah. convinced that this cotton growth management is the most impactful thing that I personally have put my hands on. Yeah. It's fun. It it makes a it makes a difference. And I'm not 
blowing it up into more than it is, but it, it's a fun thing to do. There, are, there's a lot of this work that was done back in the '80s that really kind of needed a refresh with new varieties. Because the beauty of it is, it changes every time we introduce a new set of products, and that's something we do at Scott is evaluate the response of every new generation of products as they come on. Now, that's my faith. That, that's probably the most impact impactful. And it's hard to separate the most impactful from my favorite. Because one of the things that we have found also is is that as we aggressively manage growth, whether that's done with skip row plantings or PGRs, we actually influence bowl size a little bit. And the way that we influence bowl size, and, and this is not exactly in stone yet, but we're working on the data, is it turns out that, that light penetration into the canopy and some of the things that happen as you manage size more aggressively, whether it's with skip row, you know, wide row, two in one, one in one, all that kind of stuff, or with PGRs very aggressively. We have some impact on the number of five lock bowls that occur in the field. And we're gonna get that, I got five or six years of that data, we're gonna get that published over the next little bit. The last publication that was done about that was done 103 or four years ago last year. And I kind of, took the opportunity to close the loop a little bit with some new products. And, I, and a lot of cotton farmers ask me, I always like trivia, because I find that a lot of the groups I talk to like that. And what I have found, uh, the question a lot of people ask me is, what is a five lock bowl, does it have more lint in it than a four? And traditionally, people told me, no, it does not. And I've gin over the last few years, I don't know, 15 or 20,000 bowls. It turns mm -hmm. out that a five lock bowl has 20% more lint, 20% more seed, and the lint is of the same wow. quality as a pole. Wow. Wow. That's, that's phenomenal. And it's one of those compensation mechanisms in cotton that makes cotton what it is. Mm -hmm. That's why cotton yeah. can tolerate abuses no other crop can take. It. Is it can compensate in the number, the size, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Now, I digress. I'm sorry. I, That's okay. That's what we like. Cotton, so. Jay, is there anything that we might have missed today that you want to comment on? or I, I wanted to hear a little bit about, uh, I, I know there's some work going on around fungicides. If you've got time to just kind of hit on that for a second, and how does that, does that affect PGR management? Does it, uh, what, what are some early on things that you're seeing around fungicides and cotton plants? We have. We have worked on that a little bit, and I would say that it's it's just a hair on the unclear side right, right now. Uh, what I would say and tell you today from our work is that if we have the conditions that cause, you know, fruit, uh, leaf damage, foliar disease, those sorts of things, we generally see some response from that. If we don't, we don't. And, and that's not to deflate any of that, but it's... It's kind of one of those things that we're going to have to continue to evaluate over time. Yeah. Do we have any questions? No, there's a couple comments. I think, okay. um, let's see. Um, Travis Kaufman, Jay, I'm a little hurt that Thrive On Technology wasn't your favorite. Uh, now, <laughs> well, now, I take, that. take no offense. Thrive On and then we have that, a that I'm fully committed to working on, and we're having a ball with uh, that's for next episode we'll definitely get you on again so we can talk about thrive on and what's coming in the delta pine lineup and yep. um just management over the, the the course of the cotton growing season this year we'll we'll get you on a few more times for sure and um we'll be able to talk about that more in depth yeah um, I, travis I hope that helps <laughs> i would have to say travis take no offense it, it's it's on my list but Today we're introducing the topics, and and I would add that Thrive On Technology is one of the most exciting things coming. It's novel, yeah. it's you new, it's unique, it's fun to work on, and it's going to provide yeah. us some advantage we've not had in cotton insect control in my career ever. So now, I, I look Jay, forward to continuing to evaluate. Jay, while Hannah's scrolling through, ch checking in more comments and stuff, I'll I'll, I'll ask you real quick. Uh, the groundbreaker trials that we'll have across the Carolinas this year, the majority of them will have the bigger, biggest portion of those acres is going to be Delta Pine 2131, if I, I, if I believe that that's correct. 
you give us just a couple of placement management type uh, ideas around that variety? Yes, I, I think it falls squarely in the middle of the conversation okay. we just had. It's not okay. the latest, it's not the earliest, as evidenced by the number, but yep. generally speaking, my experience has been that if people place a variety like that, they tend to place it biased toward the early, not necessarily toward the late. And when you get into okay. that middle range of varietal response, that's where this management gets blurry. And it, it really becomes sort of problematic for a lot of folks that aren't, haven't been traditionally aggressive in their plant growth regulator use. My, my guidance would be, number one, carefully evaluate the insects that, that occur in the field. You know, that's mm -hmm. very exciting technology. It's gonna do some, some marvelous things to the insect species that are threats to cotton. Threats being one of those. Uh, I'm very encouraged by the results we've observed. When it comes to the plant bugs and, and looking at that, that's something we're gonna have to continue to evaluate over time. We're gonna look at the plants as closely as we look at the insects. In other words, fruit retention is gonna become a key in the scouting, and it should be a key today for that matter, in the scouting of every field you look at. But the thing I would point out to you, all the technology, and Thrive On technology is very, very exciting. All the technology in the world doesn't mean it's not cotton. There you go, yeah. that's right. When you get right down to it, you're buying a cotton variety that has a bunch of tools in it that help you grow the crop. And one of the fundamental parts of that conversation is the growth management associated with the individual genetics you bought. And that's the information that we're trying to develop and share most directly in forums like this. And I most appreciate all you invite me. I'm, I hope we can come back and have a bunch of side conversations about all these topics. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. We do have one question and yeah. then we'll close out. Um, Josh's brother, who is uh, definitely one of our biggest fans yeah. of the show, wants to know what is the optimal, Kenneth is his name, wants to know what is the optimal planting population? How low can you go? Well, that is a... Well, that's a great topic for conversation, and I don't know that it's greatly different in the Carolinas than it is in Mississippi. I will tell you this. There's some, there's some sentiment going around in cotton business right now about greatly reducing population, particularly in some of these wide row plantings. Now, let's discount the wide row for, for the current time. I'll talk about it when anybody wants to call and ask. Traditionally, when you think about what cotton was and what cotton seed was, cotton seed processing has greatly improved in the last 25 years. I've been in this 26 years, so and I can tell you it's a much gentler, kinder, kinder process today than it was when I started. It, it And it wasn't bad then, but we are learning how to, to generate better seed. We also plant later than we used to, so we don't have, you know, if you use Mississippi as a model, uh, in Mississippi the highest yielding cotton in the state planted now the first week of May. Well, it used to be planted the second week of April and we replanted half of it. So that's right. it doesn't require as many seed out there to establish and grow and maintain a, a good crop. Now, all that evades the question he just asked. And the question you have to ask <laughs> is, what is your system? And this is what I tell growers at the Learning Center every day. What is your system? There are a few limitations that you ought to acknowledge, and there's a place where you can take the population and help your management along. If you're in a system that the cotton is always too short, you need to plant more seed, not less. If you're in a system that's always too tall, there is opportunity to reduce population, you know, 10, 15 percent versus what you traditionally have done, and it will make your growth regulators more responsive, or make the crop more responsive to your growth regulators. It make your management better. It'll, re you know, it does all kind of positive things. You get air moving in the canopy and improve light penetration and all that. But you shouldn't do those things to save money on seed inputs. You need to do those things because they're agronomically the correct thing to do. Right. Absolutely. absolutely. And and to answer his question, I would have to know what are you doing today. If you're planting forty five thousand a day, that may be too many. If you're planting 30,000 a day and trying to go lower than that, that's probably too few. 
But you also have to consider all that agronomic stuff in the background there. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's probably a good way to wind to wind this uh, second series of the yeah. second series of uh, yeah. second series of the second season. Season two. Uh, uh, season, two. <laughs> season two. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Jay, can't thank you enough for um, joining us today, and and um, Josh, always thanks for being my. My co host, you yep. know, you're doing a great job every week and or every right. other week now. And, yep. um, you know, everyone just look forward to, to bringing Jay on more often. Um, I think we, we plan to bring him on um, throughout the growing season and uh, definitely going to bring different techniques and management practices and yep. um, observations that he's seen in the field. Um, hopefully, soon we can get him, hopefully. To North Carolina That's and right. watch some cotton fields with us, and if that happens, we'll try to get something together, you know, in person if COVID will allow. And Absolutely. Um, Jay, again, thank you so much for for being here today, and to the farmers as always, thank you for everything that you that you do for us. To, I'm to absolutely. Be close to us and, I, I'm absolutely delighted to do this, I, and I hope we can do this as a series sort of thing. And talk about the individual agronomic issues as they come up. Y'all just brought up yep. planting population. We're fixing to do that next month or a little after. And that, yeah. it's time to consider all that. But I, I would add to it, just realize cotton is a different crop than a crop like corn. You know, we've made the decision about corn already. You pick the hybrid and the population and the planter and all that. In cotton, you pick the variety and kind of kind of aim at a population and the fight is on after you get the crop up and grow it. And, <laughs> and that's the fun part. And I hope we can keep this going over the summer. And I would invite anybody that is listening that, that, or that sees this after the fact, and I know a lot of people watch it after the fact, I hope we're going to get back open for business at Scott this year. Our program yeah. at the Learning Center is directed by growers. You know, if you buy in Delta Pine Cotton Seed or decaf corn or anthro beans, you're paying for the work we do at Scott. And if you heard about something today that is useful or that you'd like to see more detail, even though it's in Mississippi, give me a call and come see us because we're there for you. Absolutely. And we, we've got, we've just got a lot of tools uh, available to us these days. I mean, granted, we would love to have you out here, but you know, if somebody's looking to, to get out there and look Absolutely. at some stuff that you're doing in Scott, We've got YouTube videos. Jay, I know I follow you on, on, on your YouTube channel. You put out some great content throughout the year. Um, this Thrive On stuff is, is extremely exciting. Um, just got a lot of really good things going on. And Hannah and I look forward to continuing this series with you going forward throughout the year and just continuing the conversation yeah. overall. Yeah. So thank you again for what you do for us. Uh, thank you to our cotton growers. Um, we couldn't, couldn't be here without you guys. And um, yeah, we we look forward to what what this season holds. Delta Pine Cotton and Fair Crop Science and uh, the Scott Learning Center going forward. I'm coming to North Carolina if the world if we get the world put out if we get the fire put out. There you go. There's something. Yeah. We look forward to it. We're gonna we're gonna be we're gonna be ready for you when you get here. Uh, That's right. I bet you will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we might have you some green beer. I'm about out of here. Here's to you. Happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. <laughs>